Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. In this series, we do a close reading thematic analysis of each chapter. And today we're going to be looking at chapter two, The Vanishing Glass. We look at a total of eight different themes, starting with a, 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 dis a quick discussion of the importance of theme restatement in literature. Literature doesn't work unless you restate the theme uh, throughout the different chapters and in this case throughout the different books. So we'll recap the theme of the wasteland which was introduced in chapter one, the hero in exile and avoidance coping and the importance of following your spiders. We'll talk about the psychological significance of the Cinderella story which Harry Potter very much is. We'll talk about Dudley as a character foil and how he reflects on, on uh, the protagonist Harry and we'll talk a bit about poor old Dudley as a victim of permissive parenting which he very much is. We'll talk about intimations of self. Now this is a psychological uh, 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 Freudian psychological analysis of character of the character's development from childhood into uh, struggling towards adulthood. We'll talk about the hero's shadow, the importance of developing your dark side. We'll talk about tyranny and bullying, remembrance and alienation and detachment. What I do in each video is first identify important characteristics of each theme. And then we dig deeply into the text and pull out several quotes that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. When you're studying literature, art, music, doesn't matter what art form you're studying, you have to be you have to have a keen eye for patterns, for the motifs, what patterns are being repeated throughout the work of art, and then you find meaning from that. So motifs are rhythmic patterns of recurring words in literature, images, symbols, events, situations, behaviors, and character types that repeat themselves throughout the chapters and throughout the novel series, if you're looking at something like Harry Potter. What they do is they unify a work, and, and at the surface level, they just create a pleasing harmony and symmetry I mean, look at this. This is gorgeous. This is from the Taj Mahal, and you, re you see the repeated patterns up here. The colors and the shapes and the colors and the shapes of the flowers here are repeated. It's just really, really beautiful, and that's, it's pleasing. So we like that, first of all, but they also aid comprehension and memory of events and ideas. If you're looking at a series of books that are nine books long, then you have to repeat the themes if the author wants to keep if the, if the author thinks the theme is important, they have to repeat it so that you will remember it. Uh, this is really, really famous. This is Beethoven's fifth, the dun-dun-dun-dun, dun-dun-dun-dun. Those four notes are repeated throughout the entire movement of that famous work of art. So if you don't have restatement, you don't have music. If you don't have restatement, you don't have art. So uh, in Harry Potter uh, and hero stories generally, this is the dominant motif, as I've mentioned in, in, in chapter one, the video in chapter one. And you can think of each individual chapter as a mini cycle of the hero's quest. There has to be some kind of problem. There has to be some kind of awakening to a new problem, a new crisis that has to be solved in this particular chapter. And so we get variations of this from chapter to chapter and, of course, from book to book, as you will see in the Harry Potter series, all the way through to book seven. Okay, well, let's get a little bit closer into, uh, have a little closer look at the Wasteland Hero in Exile theme. Chapter one hinted at the future wasteland that Harry would, would be living in, and chapter two certainly reveals it. So go back and watch uh, my video on chapter one, and I go into detail about this hero's cycle. Uh, he is at home, but he is in a wasteland. He's not where he should be, and there are dragons and ogres to be slain. So few, uh, chapter one hinted at the future wasteland in exile, and chapter two reveals it. Like Cinderella, Harry is abused by those who reluctantly provide him security. Cinderella. Uh, the purpose of this, as I discuss in detail in chapter one, the purpose of this is to test the capacity for adver adversity uh, in the hero because not everyone is cut out to be a hero. Uh, and, and the wasteland in exile, it imbues the hero with certain strengths that are unlucky to those who don't have to go through these trials, like Dudley, of course. Isn't he lucky to get all the presents on his birthday? Isn't he lucky? No, he's not, he's not lucky. He's very, very, very unlucky because from future life, we know that this guy's going nowhere where this guy who's being tested, who's pushing himself, is being pushed, uh, if, he has, if he has the stuff in him, then he can emerge as the hero. There's a lesson there for all of us. So here's some evidence here. Um, the room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house. There's a wasteland. He's not where he should be. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice which made the first noise of the day. Of course, up, get up now, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare burn it. I want everything perfect. 
for the non-hero's birthday. So it's the it's the hero that suffers that will emerge the stronger person. Now that's there's a there's a lesson in there about uh, resilience and uh, avoidance coping that we're going to talk about in just a second. But just to go back to here again in chapter one, I talk about this: the isolation of the hero forces the hero inwards to summon inner resources. It's really really uh, it's a really important motif. It's a very important theme, and we see that repeated here, of course, in uh, chapter two. So avoidance coping. Follow your spiders. Follow your spiders, ladies and gentlemen. For goodness sake, follow them. Uh, the resilience that we just talked about, that the, that the hero gains in exile, in that wasteland, the resilience is symbolized in the image of the spider, is brilliant. I was rereading the books and I noticed that, oh my goodness, she put the spiders in chapter two of the whole seven book series. And then, of course, in book two, the spiders come back when, with, with Ron. Uh, it's, it's not insignificant. I think it's a brilliant little symbol. This resilience is symbolized in the image of the spider. In contrast to Ron's almost paralyzing fear of spiders in Harry Potter 2, Harry in exile has been been exposed to potential threats much, much worse. And so spiders are nothing. He grew up with spiders. He grew up with that adversity, and that makes him the hero. Ron's a really nice guy, unlike Dudley. But Ron's a really nice guy. But is he the worthy hero? No, because he doesn't have the resilience. He doesn't have it in him to be the hero because he hasn't been trained from an early age, do you see? And so, the, I, again, I talk about this more in in, uh, in, in video one, chapter one. Uh, but avoidance doesn't work. If you avoid a problem, it just makes it worse. So Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off one of them, put, they put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them. And that is where he slept. So Carl Jung. What you need most shall be found where you least want to look. In this case, it's you look under the stairs. You, you're afraid of something. That's where you should be aiming your attention. Follow your spiders. It makes you a better person. So this is from Joseph Campbell. We looked at this in the last video as well. Why the wasteland? Why the exile? Why the adversity? The myths agree that an extraordinary capacity is required to face and survive such an experience. So that experience uh, of, of hardship, even at a young age, it's important because it tests does the hero have it in him uh, or her? Uh, the young world apprentice learns the lesson of the seed powers, which reside just beyond the sphere of the measured and the named. So beyond the known world, there's something else that the hero has to go and get. And at the mythic level, they bring something back that is that is really, really profound and life-saving, which we see in book seven of the Harry Potter series. So very, very cool stuff. All right, so what is the psychological meaning of the Cinderella story? Stories that remain in circulation for generations and generations and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years in some case uh, uh, do so for a reason. Uh, they tap into something very important in our psyches that needs to be retold. And this is the genius of J.K. Rowling, which I waxed lyrical about in my previous video. So uh, this is this is a, a good book. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, have a look at The Uses of Enchantment by Bruno Bettelheim. Uh, I learned a lot about the psychology of fairy tales in this book. And, and he says here, he says, morality is not the issue, the, the issue in fairy tales, but rather the assurance that one can succeed. So in a, in a Cinderella story, we love to see the the underdog. We love, uh, kids are vulnerable. They, they're by nature, they're vulnerable. They're weak because they're small and undeveloped. And so they feel very, very insignificant. But they're, they feel insignificant vis-a-vis -vis the powers above them, their older siblings and their parents, of course. Uh, but when they watch a fairy tale, they, they see a map of their potential overcoming of that weakness uh, in the, those stories, and it really, really reassures them. So the Privet Drive Cinderella chapters of Harry Potter 1 follow the, the very pattern of fairy tales whose heroes endure the same humiliations the young reader feels, insignificance. Of course, it's an exaggerated form. The Dursleys and Dudley, it's all exaggerated, but that's storytelling. Of course, all drama, Shakespeare included, is incredibly exaggerated. The plot of Hamlet is ridiculous, but the psychology that's involved in that and revealed through those ridiculous plot elements uh, are, are electrifying. We're, we'll, we'll be watching Hamlet forever, and we'll be reading Harry Potter for a very, very long time, too, like Lord of the, Lord of the Rings, too. So in exaggerated symbolic form, those humiliations are depicted for the, young, uh, for the young readers, for the young viewers. So the child encounters a mirror of their own undesirable feelings. Uh, we, don't like, we don't like anger. A kid feels this anger, and they, they, but, they, but they don't want to. They feel that it's, it's, it's something 
unless it's Dudley kind of anger, I guess they enjoy it. But but they're, but sibling rivalry, anger, a sense of rejection and worthlessness and powerlessness are part and parcel of being a child, and they don't understand it because they they're, they haven't been trained like you're training yourself now, and I train myself by reading books like this. They don't know what's going on, and so they have these feelings, and they're un they're not understood at all. But by seeing Cinderella play out the same kinds of dramas, uh, the the child is is very much reassured. Uh, it's nourishing. Stories like this are nourishing. The J.K. Rowling uh, uh, stories are, are very nourishing for young people. And this is why I say she's one of the most important writers of the last 100 years. So the ultimate victory at the end of this particular chapter, it's the snake scene where we get to gleefully see how Harry gets revenge on uh, on his abusers in the snake scene. It's it's a cathartic assertion of, assertion of the child's power and worth. So you start off showing the child humiliated and downtrodden, and then the revenge at the end uh, uh, makes the child say, okay, well, yeah, I feel pretty crappy right now. I may be living in the cinders and the dust and the ashes like right now, but you just wait. I'll have my, I'll have, I'll become who I'm supposed to be and have my revenge, which is success. Success is always the best revenge. So here we see uh, uh, Harry, Harry wants to be left alone when the other ones are going to go off to the zoo. He says, oh, please just leave me alone so I can enjoy myself. He says, you could leave me here at home alone without a babysitter, Harry put in hopefully, and come back and find our house in ruins, says the distrustful supposed to be nurturing mother figure and petunia snarled and he says i won't blow up the house i'm not that bad i'm not incompetent says the little child i'm not incompetent please let me cook you breakfast mom and dad i won't blow up the house says harry but they weren't listening of course and adults that's what children feel they feel like they're not being listened to so being so small and indeed they are powerless of course by definition children are powerless all children feel the uh, their incompetence is under sorry their competence is undervalued and per perhaps because of that they're unloved they do there's that fear nagging at the back of children's minds a lot they subconsciously fear that these judgments are well founded yeah i do suck because everyone's my older brothers and sisters they can do stuff that i can't do do. So they feel that and, and watching the Cinderella stories really, really assures them and give those, gives them the impetus to move forward in life. We need that kind of support. Now, uh, we do need support, but <laughs> yeah, okay, we do need support, but how much? So kids feel insecure. Yes, they need support. Yes, but overly emphatic, uh, empathetic parents react to these natural insecurities with excessive validation and attention. Since the 1990s, we've developed a parenting style of the helicopter parenting. Look it up. And if you plan on having kids someday, don't do it. And great writers capture the zeitgeist. Yes, we have a couple of generations out now that were raised in these helicopter parenting styles, and it's created Dudleys. Uh, uh, the Dudley represents, the Dudley we can call them, represents the plague of little emperors, created by the current trend of single child households. That's very much a part of it. We've got one child nowadays. That's the trend across the West and in many other places in the world. And so what do you do with one child? You pour all of your resources, your love and attention into that kid, and you want them to be happy at all costs. So art holds a mirror up to nature, and this is what we see in the character of Dudley, a recognizable type that we see in the world, and J.K. Rowling nails it. So um, this is, if, if you need a definition of permissive parenting, helicopter parenting, uh, just you, you can Google it. Here's from the National Library of Medicine. You can click here if you buy the PDF. So permissive parenting, parents tend to be nurturing and usually have minimal or no expectations. So nurturing's good, no expectations, bad. They impose limited rules on their children and rarely use discipline bad. Limited rules can lead children to be unhealthy, uh, to have unhealthy eating habits. Dudley's overweight. Children of permissive parents can be impulsive. Dudley. Demanding. Dudley. Selfish. Dudley. Lacking self-regulation. Dudley. He hasn't been forced to confront his spiders and so he's a little monster. He's a little emperor. So don't be that kind of person. Uh, don't create those kinds of people if you plan on having kids someday. So what does this mean for literature? For literature, it means that, that Dudley is a really good character foil. We see a really good contrast between the worthy and the unworthy, the worthy hero and the unworthy non-hero. So all characters, by the way, are foils for every other character. Ron reflects on Hermione, Hermione reflects on Ron and, and everything else. So, the, so, so you can look at characters in that way. And they draw attention to certain good and bad traits by comparison and contrast. So of course, Dudley's unworthiness contrasts with Harry's embryonic heroic qualities, making Harry appear even more worthy. So here we see the famous scene about the presence, uh, really, really clearly indicating that uh, Dudley is certainly unworthy. He's demanding and selfish. So Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presence and his face fell because he wasn't getting enough. 
36, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you, you haven't counted Aunt Marge's present. See, it's here under this big one for Mummy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger too because she said quickly, and we'll buy another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? So look at the role reversal. The, the, the parent asking permission of the child. I've seen that. I was, I, was on a, I was on a subway somewhere, and I saw an adult ask a five-year-old if it's okay to sit next to him. They were friends. There was a group of friends, and there were a couple of two different families, and there were three kids, and the adult said, is it okay if I sit here? Unbelievable. Anyway, so that's, that's, there's Dudley, the, uh, uh, the monster, and here's Harry. Harry's stoic forbearance and gratitude. Gratitude. That's something that is in sore short supply these days. Harry's stoic forbearance and gratitude generate sympathy and admiration in us, the readers. So here's Harry when they're out. They finally, Harry finally goes to get to go to the zoo and they bought Harry a cheap, it's not even nice. It's not, it's not 36 presents or 37 presents. They bought him a cheap lemon ice lolly. It wasn't bad either, thought Harry, licking it as they watched the gorilla scratching its head and looking remarkably like Dudley. So again, there's that contrast. Uh, she slips in the contrast with Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. So there's the worthy hero. Patience and endurance, those virtue qualities of, of a good hero. And we root for Harry and we laugh and we should cry for poor Dudley. Chapter two, of course, is all about the, the, the struggling of Harry's psyche to make itself felt, his will to make itself felt in the world. And it's glorious. There are, there are four times where Harry's magic powers, and again, magic powers are only a metaphor for uh, the, an individual's personality, their own self that's trying to emerge. And a child is not fully formed. It's trying to emerge. So four times in chapter two, Harry, Harry's magic powers emerge unbidden as impulses rather than consciously controlled actions. Now, that's that we know that. We watch it and we enjoy that and we sense something's going on there, some kind of significance. Well, you can, you can figure out what the significance is. If you look at Freud, if you look at your psychology, you recognize this instantly. It maps beautifully onto Freud's uh, notion of the, the, the id, the, the ego, and the superego. So these eruptions, they're eruptions, they're impulsive eruptions, are the result of dangerous frustrations felt by all children. Children are controlled by their id. Their id is that uh, irrational center of primitive impulses. I want, I want, I want, I want. That's Dudley. So Dudley's all id. It's uncontrolled. Now, the, Freud uh, uh, identified the superego as the demands of society. Yeah, fine. You can have your urges. We all have urges, primitive urges, but you've got to, you've got to fit those into the way society works in a way that's productive, do you see? And the way we do that, Freud said, is we, we use our ego, this part of our psyche. There's three parts of our psyche, according to Freud. We use our ego, which is the rational negotiator, to wisely look at the requirements of society and say, okay, well, here's what I need, and here's how society is mapped out. So if I want to satisfy my needs in a way that will make my life better instead of worse, this is what I got to do. So the, id, the, the ego is the, uh, the rational negotiator. So Dudley has none of this, and Harry is learning it now. And this is, this is where we see his, his, here we see his id making itself felt. These eruptions are the result of dangerous frustrations of the id making itself felt. But especially by those, uh, they're felt by all children, but especially by children with inadequate parents. So the Dudley parent, they've got these frustrations and they're, and they're selfish and they're just making themselves felt, as I said, and, and, and it's, they're not being trained the way they should be trained. Uh, these feelings must be confronted, understood, and resolved. So the job of a good parent is to say, okay, honey, you've got these feelings. All right, fine. So this is what, you're, this is what your feelings are. Well, here's how you can get what you need in a way that makes everybody happy and makes life better. That's what a, a mature, responsible adult is supposed to do for the kids. Uh, but neglectful parents or overly permissive parents don't do an adequate job of that. So uh, in the fairy tale context, in the mythic fairy tale uh, 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 storytelling context, fairy tales caution against the destructive consequences if one fails to develop higher levels of responsible selfhood. That's what the ego is supposed to be doing teaching you how to become a responsible adult. Take these primitive two-year-old 
tantrum fits and and figure out what you're supposed to do with those things because we do have impulses that need to be addressed and satisfied but in a, in a in a mature way to the child these fairy tales subtly very very subtly suggest why we ought to strive for higher integration of these urges and what's involved in it we we watch dudley and we say i'm not going to be that guy that's what that's what uh, uh Beetleheim also suggested a, a quote somewhere he said uh fairy tales don't wag a finger at us and tell us what we should do they show us what who we should be i want to be harry and not dudley i see what dudley's doing and there's something wrong with it so i'm going to be like harry which means i'm going to gradually integrate my uh my id into uh, a, a more sophisticated mature person so to the child these t- these tales subtly suggest why he ought to strive for higher integration and what's involved in it these same stories also intimate to a parent that he ought to be aware of the risks involved in his child's development oh my goodness parents who read harry potter to their kids or read harry potter themselves or read it when they were younger remember the lessons of dudley when you're raising your own kids that's what fairy tales are supposed to do yeah they educate the parents at the same time they educate the young people isn't that glorious and rowley nailed it she nailed it in these early stories in the, all of the series there's so much going on in all seven books so here here are these instances you remember them the next morning however uh, so he has a bad haircut he hates his haircut that that uh, Patu- he gives him and it magically grows back so next morning however he had got up to find his hair exactly as it had been before and Petunia had sheared it off he couldn't explain how it had grown back the id took over there was an impulsive uh, uh, manifestation of his will in the world okay the will the the id made itself manifest by uh, uh, this impulsive um, eruption Another one, the harder she tried to pull the old crappy old jumper, the sweater over uh, Harry's head, the smaller it seemed to become. So he, his id took over, his will in the world took over, perhaps adequately, perhaps this, this, this was a, a good way to go. But if he keeps doing this throughout life, he's going to be, uh, he's, he's going to be a monster in society with those magic powers. Uh, some super superhero stories talk about that, the young child who hasn't integrated their powers properly. And there's, 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 that's part of the metaphor. So the jumper became smaller and smaller until it until it uh, might have fitted a, a glove puppet. So there's an eruption of his id as well. Uh, again, Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual. When Harry's, uh, when much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, he was sitting on a chimney. So he magically made himself jump up onto the top of a chimney, which is bad news because he's supposed to learn how to control his powers because the Ministry of Magic is going to get him and the muggles are going to find out what's going on. So it's poorly integrated, inchoate expressions of self. Inchoate is a cool word. It means it's unformed. It's there, but it's unformed, and uncontrolled, not understood. So we get the magic number three, and that sets up the final one with the snake when he removes the glass. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, I guess we talked about all of this. Let me just read through these. So Harry's powers have been neglected. They haven't been overindulged. His id hasn't been overindulged. It's actually been neglected. And you can't neglect your id either because you do have these needs. They have not yet been tamed, harnessed, so that they can be put that, so that they can be put to appropriate and more effective use. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. If, there, if you're a teenager listening to this, you take that energy, you take that teen energy, that Im- perhaps impulsiveness, and you train it. You train it, and you become a beast in the world, and you really make yourself a better person, and thereby making the world a better place to live in. Go back and watch video one. I talk about that. Uh, they are still uh, very much part of his wild, undisciplined id. That's part of the process of growing up. You have to discipline your id. Discipline it. Make it. It's a team of wild horses. Harness it and go, go, go. So Hogwarts, this is what school is supposed to do. Good schools. A lot of teachers are idiots. And a lot of teachers are like Dudley's parents. And they're overly permissive. And they're not teaching people, young people, how to take what they've got in them and to really make themselves useful in the world and to themselves. So Hogwarts society, together with the mentors and the helpers, which are supposed to be our teachers in the real world. And Harry Potter is very, very fortunate. We see these ideal mentors like... Sirius Black and, and Dumbledore and Mrs. Weasley. We see these great mentors and helpers in the world, uh, and they're supposed to help us train our egos to navigate between the id's primitive, destructive pleasure seeking and the super ego's recognition of and adaptation to the social norms and mores. Mores. It is it's destructive. Left on its own, the id is destructive. Those impulses will destroy you. And so you get pleasure seeking, pleasure seeking, pleasure seeking, pleasure seeking until you're 40 years old and you've done nothing but seek pleasure and you're absolutely useless to society and yourself and you're depressed. Ah, so, 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 so sad. Uh, listen to the lessons of 
The fairy tales, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so speaking of which, let's talk about the hero's shadow, the integrated beast. This theme is the dominant theme of the seven books. I just rewatched uh, the last movie uh, in the series yesterday, and I was reminded again of how important this is. Harry and Voldemort are one, and in order for the hero to be a hero, they have to have the beast in them integrated. Their id, that beast power of the id, has to be integrated for the greater good of society. That's what the hero is. It's wonderful, wonderful stuff. So chapter two introduces a central theme in the entire Harry Potter series. Harry is the snake, Nagini, Voldemort, and they are one. To destroy a beast, the hero must become a beast. They must be a beast. He must have a well-integrated Jungian shadow. So look at that. The Carl Jung mapped this out first for us. But our ancient, ancient myths and religions and everything have this built into them as well. That shadow, the shadow self, is a dark power that can be summoned when required. It has to be controlled. Those are those wild horses. And they have to be put to good use. So here's a quote from the collected works of Carl Jung. To become conscious of one's shadow involves recognizing the dark aspects of personality as real and present. We, we, have to, we have to look at it and say, yeah, that's what it is. This, this is in me. Now what do I do with it? And that's, that's what, that's what the, the most successful people in the world, look at the most successful people in the world that have fought, fought, fought to get to the top of their profession and, and, are, and are a boon to society because of that. And they've got that darkness in them. They're, they able to, they're able to fight against the odds. This act is an essential condition for any kind of self-knowledge. Without that, you, you flounder through your whole life. Now, the cool thing about uh, the hero stories is it, it reminds us that, yeah, we've, 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 we've got to do this, but we don't have to do it alone. We've got helpers and we've got mentors for this process. Uh, if you're lucky, you find these. Uh, again, someone like Dudley doesn't have that useful mentor. He has useless mentors, and they're doing nothing to develop uh, uh, anything useful in him to become a, a, a boon to society. So, oh, I love the reptile house. It's such a cool metaphor. Where does Harry meet his self? Where does he meet his dark shadow self? In a cave. Go back and watch my chapter one. The, the caves, water, uh, darkness, owls. These are all nocturnal symbols of, uh, of the self, of the subconscious. And this is where he meets himself for the first time in the whole seven books. And it comes back, those motifs. It comes back. The cycles, cycles, cycles return to this for seven books, it's it's brilliant, brilliant storytelling. So unsurprisingly, the reptile house where Harry will meet his uh, first meet his shadow self is described as a cave. Listen to this: it was cool and dark in here, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling, slithering over bits of wood and stone. That's cave. It's a cave. It's basically a cave. Do you see? It's dark and creepy. Welcome to yourself. Welcome to your shadow self. You need it. You need that. Here's some more evidence here. Harry, of course, when he meets the snake, he instinctively feels empathy for the snake, empathy for Nagini, empathy for Voldemort, and that suggests a connection, a potential integration where, with the dark energies of his psyche. He's in tune with it, not so Dudley. Here's Dudley over here, just pleasure-seeking, 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 pleasure-seeking. Do you see? While the hero confronts the darkness. What you need most shall be found where you least want to look, in scary places. Go, go, go. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look uh, that said, quite plainly, I get that all the time. Sigh. And Harry says, yes, I know. Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. So there, there's a bond here. There's a natural, empathetic bond. When Dudley interrupts the communion, so the idiot uh, bursts in, Harry's id kicks in, and here we see this is the fourth grand finale of this particular chapter uh, where his id takes over, uh, and the hero demonstrates his ne necessary capacity for causing harm. He does. He releases the snake, and everyone in the, in the whole society scatters and is afraid. Now, was that a good move? It was really satisfying as, in terms of the fairy tale kid's story, but it was pretty dangerous, and Harry has to learn how not to be dangerous to other people, how to take the powers that are in him and to use them uh, uh, so that society doesn't get bitten by a snake, do you see? So Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out on the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exit. So yeah, it's all good fun because we know it's good fun because we're in a kid's story. Uh, but it's potentially really dangerous. And if you grow up, imagine him as, a, as an adult going around doing whatever he wants, letting his id run free. Then you'd have a, a, a big, big, big problem. Okay, so now let's talk about tyranny and bullying. 
The abuse of power, of course, is a, another central theme for the whole seven books. Ultimately, we arrive at the ultimate supreme tyrannical abuse of power in Voldemort. Uh, but in book one, we're still in the fairy tale kids world, and we see micro versions of that uh, 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 ultimate macro bullying, the macro tyranny that we see with Voldemort. So the abuse of power is usually uh, is usually at the center of all hero stories in some form. There has to be a tyrant that you have to fight against. In chapter two, we see the first two levels of bully of the bullying theme that is explored in the Harry Potter series. At the micro level, we see the one-on-one -on -one bullying. Yes, that's the, at, the, at the, the school ground bullying that a, a young person can recognize uh, that Harry receives from uh, Dudley. We also see the social bullying that Harry receives. Uh, if, if we had defined the family of uh, as a as a kind of social level, it's not an interpersonal level. And of course, school and society, Harry is picked on not just by Dudley, but, but by peers. And he's alone in, in school as well. So he's being bullied in the social realm too, not yet in the cosmic realm that's coming up later. Uh, so these levels are immediately comprehensible to the child reader and prepare them for the macro bullying which is coming, the wider social and cosmic cruelty and violence they will encounter in the supreme tyrant and bully, Voldemort, the sadistic lord of the wasteland. So here we see uh, on page 25, Piers was a scrawny boy. He's a friend of Dudley with a, with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind his backs, by, behind their backs while Dudley hit them. So that's the recognizable sadism. It's the fear that a child can handle and, and they understand. Uh, and 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 they see how somebody can can uh, the, the necessity of, of being able to fight back. When we talk about fighting back, that's you're talking about an integrated shadow that has the capacity for fighting back. Do you see? So at the first level, we see this comic, uh, 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 the comic bullying. It's frightful enough for a child, but for us, it's like okay, yeah, a fairy tale. But then we get to the Voldemort stuff, and we can see the allegory as well behind it, because Voldemort is a, is a tyrant in the world. Stalin, Mao, Hitler, those kinds of guys. Uh, that, that's, of course, what, what Voldemort represents. So the abuse of power, an important theme. Now let's look at memory and remembrance and memory. Many, if not most, that's a question mark, hero stories are also coming-of-age stories, the Bildungsroman in, in, in German. Uh, they are. The, 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 this involves several symbolic deaths. I've talked about this a bit in Chapter 1 as well. Uh, the childhood self must die so that the new mature self can be born. And interestingly, the, the, the parents must die. Uh, in, it's absolutely glorious when Dumbledore dies. Uh, he actually says, please. In order for the young person to become who they are, they've got to get the damn parent out of the way. Uh, the, ty the tyrant parent is the parent that doesn't, the Oedipal parent, the consuming parent, is the parent that doesn't want the young person to become themselves. They want to consume the, the young person's lives for their own benefit. That's a, it's a vampiric relationship, and, and Malfoy's parents are like that. Malfoy is trapped, and we're going to talk about that in future books. It's absolutely gorgeous. So the P Dumbledore is the perfect parent. He's the ideal parent figure. He willingly lets himself die so that Harry can become who he is. He knows that. Uh, he knows that. And J.K. Rowling knew that. It's absolutely gorgeous. So the childhood self must die, yes, but the parents must die as well. These deaths are necessary, and they're very, very painful. Um, it's heartbreaking. That scene, again, I've been rewatching the movies to remind myself of plot elements. And that scene where Dumbledore dies is, is absolutely heartbreaking. And, and it's, that's, this is why this, these books are so important. They're retelling these important stories again and again and, and, and reshaping them for a future generation. It's, it's, it's wonderful and so necessary. What makes, what makes them difficult uh, is the persistent memory of seemingly happier, innocent days free of adult concerns and burdens. The death of your childhood is painful. We all look back in nostalgia and we kind of sometimes wish that we were back there. But no, we can't. We've got to be mature adults and look at the difficulties of life forthrightly. And if you haven't been prepared for that, you're not prepared for that. And you're going to be crushed by those memories of childhood. And you're not going to grow up and you're not going to mature. Read your Harry Potter, read your Harry Potter. So yearning for and mourning of the past plays an important role in Harry Potter. He overcomes it. And we're going to talk about the Mirror of Erised soon, which is another gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous metaphor. Uh, how do you deal with the pain of the disappearance of your past? How do you deal with it? The past and memory become a source of great strength in later books, as well as a source of pain. And the strength we see is in the Patronus. The Patronus is the, and Harry has his mother's eyes. That's the spirit of the parent. And the ghosts of the parent come back in, in a fairy tale form in, in the final uh, books, the final chapters of the whole series. And that's what, that's what gives the, the young person energy. If the parents have done their job early on, that spirit of the parent is in 
the young person who's not a young person anymore, they're a mature adult. It's gorgeous. Again, this is from Bruno uh, Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment. The tree which Cinderella plants on her mother's grave and waters with her tears is one of the most poetically moving and psychologically significant features of the story. Cinderella mourning the loss of her mother, of her parent figure. It symbolizes that the memory of the idealized mother or father, we can say as well, when kept alive, is an important part of one's internal experience, can and does support us even in the worst adversity. Children with mature, adequate parents become mature, adequate adults themselves. And without that mature parenting, you don't get this. You don't get the Patronus charm. The Patronus charm is the, is the spirit of the father. Patra, uh, pater means father. It's the spirit of the father that, that provides Harry with the impetus to move forward well in the world and with courage and with uh, 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 determination and, and confidence. It's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful metaphor. That comes up in book three. We're going to talk about that later. But here it is introduced in the, in the first book. So sometimes when he strained his memory, here's a, towards the end of chapter, uh, uh, of chapter two, when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision. That's what we all have of our childhood is this distant, strange vision. And if there are positive aspects in that, or even negative as, negatives as well, that were supported by useful mentors and helpers, that can that can build our character and move us forward in the world. A blinding flash of green light and a burning pain in his forehead. Of course, that's what he remembers of the Voldemort attack. This, he supposed, was the car crash, though he couldn't figure, he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. That comes back, that gets corrected, and he is able to, to reconnect with his parents. And so he's got that spirit of the mother, the spirit of the father that follows him uh, throughout the entire book, without which he wouldn't be the hero. Wow, such important stuff. Okay, so we'll wrap up today with alienation and detachment. Chapter two ends, of course, with a return to the major theme of isolation of the hero, which we've talked about. Uh, in later books, this isolation continues to weigh heavily on Harry. Despite his loyal helpers and mentors, the Dumbledores, the Snapes even, uh, and Ron and Hermione, the hero is essentially alone with his exceptionalness. And in the very, very, very final book, of course, he, he leaves... Uh, the world and dies metaphorically and then comes back and it's all alone he has to do it alone like frodo has to be the ring bearer uh ultimately at the end alone and the batman as well he's got his mentors but he's out there alone fighting crime at the fairy tale level the the, the child reader is encouraged by the assertion that the isolation the child feels they do the parents are up there doing their own thing and it's a weird world and they don't have access to it really and they feel isolated from that uh, uh, so the child feels uh, uh, is encouraged by the uh, assertion that the isolation he feels can be overcome harry commiserates with the isolation of the boa constrictor who like him has never known a home but then is freed like harry will be so there's the encouragement Encouragement, and we, we see it, it's a return to this. He feels alone. He feels isolated like the snake. And the snake and Harry are one, as we've discussed. Uh, so where do you come from anyway, Harry asked the snake. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Bow constrictor Brazil. Uh, Was it nice in Brazil, Harry says. Uh, the bow constrictor jabbed its tail at a sign again, and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil. So there's the isolation. The detachment for the hero and his shadow. Both of them are, are detached. They're dislocated. They are isolated. And here's some of the significance from Joseph Campbell. Uh, he talks about at the higher level. Now, this is the fairy tale level. At the higher level, the cosmic level, the real journey is like book seven. Harry has to spiritually leave this world uh, alone in order to become the, the savior hero. The, so the first step of the Buddha... Mohammed goes into the desert and finds uh, finds something huge and brings it back to the world, like the great world-saving savior hero. So the first step, detachment or withdrawal, consists in a radical transformation of emphasis from the external to the internal world. The hero goes inward to find that that something something glorious something transcendent do you see so the macro to the microcosm a retreat from the desperations of the wasteland to the peace of the everlasting realm that is 
within. Again, the last chapters of Harry Potter uh, uh, talk about this beautifully. He meets the Father. He becomes the at one with the Father. The apotheosis, the becoming of the God, happens in Book 7, at the end of Book 7. So the real cosmic inward journey is ahead for Harry, and I'm getting ahead of myself right now because it's all so cool I can't stop talking about it. At the cosmic, mythic, religious level, the hero-savior must leave the modane, quotidian world behind and enter alone the, uh, a higher plane of consciousness beyond the immediate comprehension of the Muggles. That's Harry for sure. Now, in book one, we're still at the, at the fairy tale childhood level, so he doesn't understand that at all. Of course, Harry feels only the separateness. He only feels the sad isolation that all children feel at some point in their childhoods. He doesn't understand that all of this is preparation for the ultimate savior act, the at one with the father and the mother, he has his mother's eyes, which he so tragically lack he, he lacks and yearns for, of course. And so this is these are the final words of chapter two. Chapter two is a big chapter. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses. Nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. There he is. That those are the last words. It's an important chapter, it really is. So hang in there, hero. The isolation is forcing the hero inwards to summon inner resources, like all of the great savior stories in the world, in our myths and our religions. It's gorgeous stuff in our, at, our, at our own microcosmic levels as well. We've got to do uh, some version of that. Okay, so that was Five Quotes Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 2. I hope you found it interesting, and if you did, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.